Please take your seats. So, um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining today's original thinking lecture at Alliance Manchester Business School, which is being delivered by Professor Sheena Johnson. My name is Eleanor O'Connor. I am Professor of Occupational Psychology, and I'm also Deputy Head of the Business School. And I'm standing in today for Professor Fiona Devine, the Head of School, who unfortunately cannot be here this afternoon. On behalf of Fiona, I would like to welcome everyone to this afternoon's lecture. And Sheena, uh, Fiona particularly asked that I pass on her best wishes to you. So Sheena is Professor of Work Psychology and Wellbeing at AMBS. And today she is presenting the latest in our original thinking lectures, in which we hear from the school's new and recently promoted professors who are delivering their inaugural lectures. Um, I have to say it is a great pleasure to see so many people here today at AMBS in person coming to attend Sheena's lecture. But of course, we also too welcome our online audience who are joining us this afternoon from across the world. And looking at the list of attendees, I can see that there are people here from joining us from uh, continental Europe, the US and Hong Kong. But in particular, I would like to offer a very warm welcome to members of Sheena's family who are attending online today to share in Sheena's success. So Sheena's work focuses on health and well-being at work, which clearly is a subject uh, very important to individuals, uh, to organizations, to economies, and to wider society. And of course, it's a topic which is gaining particular prominence given the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. So this afternoon, Sheena is going to begin by outlining her research on well-being at work before focusing on well-being in the context of an aging workforce, as well as her more recent studies on the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic for well-being. As part of her research on aging and well-being, Sheena has been instrumental in creating the Age, Health and Professional Drivers Network, which brings together organizational and union representatives involved in addressing issues of age, health, and well-being, specifically in the transport sector. Sheena's important work on the aging workforce was one of the research impact case studies that formed AMBS's recent very successful impact submission to REF 2021. Sheena's research has been widely published and she sits on the editorial board of several journals, including the International Journal of Stress Management. Sheena is the University of Manchester's lead on social change and ageing at the Thomas Ashton Institute. And she also sits on the management board of the Manchester Institute for Collaborative Research on Ageing. So today, after Sheena has presented her lecture, there will, of course, be time for questions, and I'm sure we'll have many of those. So those of you who are in the room, please just, um, at the end of the lecture, raise your hand as, as normal. Uh, and for those of you who are online, please add any questions you have to the Zoom chat during the lecture or afterwards. And we would also like to invite those of you who are here in person to join us for drinks in the foyer immediately after the lecture. And that will give you plenty of time to uh, have discussion with Sheena and pose additional questions to her. And now with introductions complete, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Professor Sheena Johnson. Thank you very much and thank you for everyone for, for attending today. Um, it's really glad to see so many people in the room um, and I know there's a lot of people online as well. I just want to say a huge thank you to you, to you all for finding the time to do that. Um, it's an inaugural lecture so I believe that means I can talk about anything and you've all got to be really nice about it. <laughs> so that's a good start. Um, but after, I kind of thought well where do you start because there's so much to cover. Um, and that's good because that immediately isn't working. It's like teaching all over again. Right, not that working though. So can you have a quick look at that? So yeah. So where do I start? So I thought the first thing that I wanted to say was that I never planned to be an academic. Like just it wasn't a plan. I actually never even planned to do a PhD. You know, I kind of accidentally ended up doing a PhD, which is a bit um, a bit crazy, really. 
what happened was I did my master's in Manchester at UMIST as it was at the time. Um, and once I finished the master's, I was like, right, I need to look for a job. So I, I applied for a job as a research assistant in Liverpool University. And during the interview, the person who subsequently became my line manager said, if you want to, when you get offered the job, would you be interested in doing a PhD? And I gave it zero thought and immediately <laughs> just went, yeah, definitely. I'd really be up for that. Obviously, I got offered the job and then I had to do it. <laughs> I was kind of committed to doing it. Um, but I, I mean, it was, a, it was a great experience and I'm, re I'm really glad I did that. Um, I then got the lectureship here subsequently a number of years later, um, and I'm still here about 16 years on, so um, I must be doing something right. I had some really good early career advice, so I've, I've been fortunate to have some great colleagues over the years. So two bits of early career advice. One is on the slide. So the, the first one is, you know, you need to be really focused. If you want to be a successful academic, you need to narrow your research topic down. You need to be known as an expert in your field and you need to be really clear about what that is. That was fantastic advice. It's actually really hard to follow and you'll probably be able to tell me by the end how, um, how spectacularly I've failed at, at following that advice. And the second bit of advice just out of interest was you've got to learn to say no to things, you know, because you'll get asked to do loads of things and you have to be able to you know, pick what you say yes and no to, which was also very good advice. And both things that I say to new academics coming in now. So I did think about what am I going to talk about today because there's loads of stuff I could talk about. So I focused <laughs> it down a little bit. I've still got lots of slides. So I'm going to talk about health and well-being because that's really been kind of the thread that runs through all of my research. So I'm going to focus on that, talk about kind of the early stuff that I did and then where that developed and where it went to. And as Ellen has already introduced, I'm going to talk about well-being and the ageing workforce and, and a little bit about the impact case and the ageing drivers network that I developed. Um, so that's the middle bit. And then, of course, COVID. All right. So COVID, this huge thing that happened. Um, what about, what, what, where would my research gone in that direction, given the kind of the COVID situation? Um, and I'm sure we're still only really at the start. Um, of what will be many years of looking into what the impact of COVID is and what, what it will continue to be over the years. So I'm already going to, I need to speed up. <laughs> All right, so here we start. So these are, these are two of my really early papers. So these were published while I was doing my PhD. My PhD wasn't on health and wellbeing, it was something else completely. This, this was just kind of an interest. Um, and, and I put these up mainly because these two papers kind of tricked me into thinking that publishing was quite easy, <laughs> right? And I've since discovered it's really not easy at all. <laughs> it's one of the most hardest things we do. But the first, the top paper, the stress and health paper was um, actually a publication from my master's, you know, which, which I was fortunate enough to, to get published. And then the second, the bottom bit, which is the table, that you obviously can't read because it's much too small in here. But what all it is, is a rank ordering of different occupations based on psychological health, physical health and job satisfaction. And so it's quite a simple analysis, it's not complicated, um, but it's been my most highly cited paper ever. And I don't think I'm ever gonna surpass it. And that was before I even got the lectureship. So I've been downhill since then. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm really, obviously really happy that it got that interest but one thing I wanted to point out as well is that I should have listened to my own advice because you can see the lecturers there <laughs> <laughs> kind of suffer the worst psychological well-being than average and I maybe should have taken a little bit more notice of that at the time um, and a bit more on that a bit more on academic stress later on so at once I started working in Manchester and I started really kind of applying myself to the health and wellbeing research, I started thinking about, well, what do we, how do we apply it really in the real world? Because that's where my interest comes in. You know, what, 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 what does it mean? What's the actual experience of, of poor health in work and what does that, what does it link to? And these are a couple of papers that kind of looked at that. So the top one was looking at the links between the experience of stress and, and poor health and well-being at work on, on the impact on productivity. And we were able to demonstrate in this paper that you know that the poorer psychological well-being is associated with lower productivity and the stress of not having the right resources to do the job is also unsurprisingly linked to lower productivity. 
And commitment from the organisation also really important. The more committed you think the organisation is, the more productive you are likely to consider yourself being. So that, that was interested in kind of loop. So we're starting to look at like the outcomes of stress. And then the bottom study is, is, is some work that I did with the pharmacy school. I'm really glad there's some, some of the colleagues from pharmacy here today, which is lovely. Um, and these, we did a number of studies, a number of papers, again, looking at stress in the pharmacy profession and thinking about what are the issues within that profession. And we identified things like overload, unsurprisingly, work-life balance, work relationships, um, all being things that, that pharmacists considered that were, um, you know, uh, important to them and a potential cause of stress. And then again, that focus on outcomes. So we looked at errors. So what, you know, is the experience of stress at work linked to the reporting of errors? Um, and again, we found that perceived levels of overload were linked to dispensing errors and lack of resources or poor communication was linked to detecting prescribing errors, which was just, you know, kind of really interesting. And again, it's just an illustration of that's the direction my research was going in. You know, I'm interested in, in, in the outcomes. What, what, what does poor health cause what, and what can we do about it? And then for a more recent study was looking at academic stress. Again, you know, so, so a number of things in the academic profession that have been identified as being potentially stressful. So things like perceptions of decreased autonomy and decreased job security, and of course, increased student numbers, which um, you know, has been happening for, for a number of years. And we did a study that looked at comparing kind of academics and non-academics, but all working within a higher education setting and found that there were different stresses that were relevant and um, depending on the job. And um, you won't be surprised to hear that things like um, work overload were identified and, and, and poor work-life balance as well were, were also identified. But there were some positives as well, so I don't want to just focus on the negatives. So academics typically reported better job conditions than non-academics, um, better work relationships, and having less concern about things like pay and benefits. So it's not a bleak picture, it's just, it's just really interesting to look at what's happening within different professions. And of course, COVID has changed a lot of things. You know, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later in terms of how COVID is changing jobs, what that might mean from a health and wellbeing perspective and what we might need to think about looking at in the future. So alongside, so all of this was kind of the, the build up, I suppose, to, to really kind of narrowing my research topic down a little bit, which I've been endeavouring to do. And I started to get interested in um, the um, older work, the ageing workforce, and in particular looking at wellbeing. So we know, so age discrimination be became um, under the Equality Act, so age discrimination wasn't, was, was something that, that organisations were having to think about. There were a lot of changes in terms of retirement, and um, so retirement age was abolished, we have an ageing population, and um, there are a lot of kind of drivers to keep people in work for longer. Um, organisations are going to have to react to that, but at the same time, we're seeing high levels of age discrimination, and I just thought, oh, this is really interesting, you know. So these three papers started to look at well-being and age, um, and really thinking about, well, what are the potential qualities of older workers? Because we see in, in a lot of the age discrimination literature, this kind of argument that there's a, there's a kind of a deficit hypothesis that as we get older, we just get worse at things. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's kind of, that's what underpins a lot of the negative stereotypes of, of, of older individuals. But of course, that's going to be more of a problem if we're all staying in work to an older age, but we're all actually being discriminated against. And another thing that makes me really interested in age discrimination is actually the only type of discrimination we will all potentially be exposed to. If we're lucky enough to live long enough, we will likely experience age discrimination. So it's, it became quite salient. You know, I thought, right, this is something that, that I'll look at. So these studies, and I'm not going to talk too much about the detail of these, um, but they are looking at the experience of stress in the workplace, how we use different stress management strategies, how we use different conflict management strategies, and the ways in which we might regulate and manage our emotions in the workplace. So they're three separate papers. But really, the thread running through that is that the evidence suggests that as we get older, we get better able to select appropriate strategies and better able to deal with um, certain situations. So these 
such studies were all set within um, customer facing environments. So if you imagine if you in the first place, you are less likely to be exposed or to perceive a situation as, as, as being um, like an aggressive customer as you get as with age. So that either our perception is different or, you know, people are treated more respectfully as they get older and either of those could be true. Um, but what the research did demonstrate is that with age, we tend to just be better able to decide how to manage a situation, what strategy to use. And that might be through age, it might be through work experience, it might be through life experience. There's a number of possible explanations for that. But the, the kind of the evidence clearly shows that there is a difference, you know, and, and, and I think it's important to kind of recognise that difference because it argues against the deficit hypothesis. So we don't just get worse at things as we get older. In fact, there is evidence to show that sometimes we get better at things as we get older. You know, so, so this, this was the sort of the argument that I was starting to talk about, myself and colleagues, I should have, it's not just, just myself on my own. And that kind of my work in the ageing workforce, and there's a lot more, but I don't have, to, I don't have time to cover everything. Um, but that kind of led to me being asked or invited to write this review, which was for the um, Government Office for Science. It was a foresight review, and it was really looking at how, what are the different experiences of people of different ages within the workforce? And it's got a really long title, but I won't bring it out. It's not a very snappy title. Um, I, uh, so, but anyway, the link is there if anyone's interested in looking at it. And I'm not going to pull out all of that. The evidence review itself would take me two hours to talk about. But I've, so I've just picked out some of the health bits because I thought that this is really what, what I'm focusing on. And we can see that, you know, age does bring kind of increases in physical health problems. So things like musculoskeletal disorders <laughs> or cardiovascular disease. But typically cognitive performance isn't impacted till about the age of 70 to 80, which of course is above the, you know, the, the, the likely retirement age, above working age. And um, we do see that generally psychological health um, decreases with age. Which is, which is a shame, but then it does get better as you get, as you get to the older age groups. Although that is possible that it's a healthy worker effect. And um, if you're not familiar with the healthy worker effect, that is just, you know, for the people who are unhealthy, for whatever reason, exit the workforce. So the people that you're left kind of measuring as such are all the healthy people who are left. So that, that's what we call the healthy worker. <laughs> there was lots of evidence of age discrimination as well, which I've already talked about. Um, and I talked a lot about the changing demographics and how the workforce is going to change in the future, how organisations are going to have to respond and adapt to this. Um, and really then folks, and I've highlighted that bottom bit because it ties into what I'm going to talk about next. Um, but this idea that there are occupation and industry differences with regard to health and safety, which makes sense. Right? So depending on the job that you do will depend on the type of risk uh, health exposures that you are subjected to, and also the type of support that would be appropriate. But we have fairly limited insight into that. So that kind of led me to think, okay, so it's health and wellbeing, older workers, it's all changing, what, you know, what, what can we do? And, and I was doing some work with um, colleagues in the health and safety executive at the time, and we just, just started to have a look at the driving population. So, and in particular, kind of HGV and LGV drivers. And what we identified in this is that the average age, basically the driving industry has got an older worker issue in that their population that they um, employ are typically, you know, they're, they're, there is an aging population and they're not attracting younger workers into the industry. So as you can see here, we've got about 13% of drivers are over the age of 60, whereas only 2% are under the age of 25. The average age is around 50 years and is predicted to just keep increasing. Um, so there is an issue within this. And that means, well, it means two things. It means that they need to kind of look at how they can support and retain drivers it also means that they were open to researchers coming in and talking to them which really, really helped obviously and we know also as well as that alongside the aging argument that there is multiple risk factors associated with the job and i've, I've listed those risk factors there um, and so things like sleep deprivation exposure to stress um, and working shifts and so on are all kind of identified as, as, as health and well-being issues. And these have been shown to be linked to certain medical conditions as well. 
So this means that there's, within that industry, there was a real kind of opportunity to kind of explore this in a little bit more detail, um, which is exactly what we went on to do. So we did a two phase study over a, a, a couple of years. The first phase we talked to um, a, a number of drivers and managers and supervisors and just did interviews across five different companies. Um, and a report, HSE report was published from that. Again, it's linked there if you're interested. The second phase, we started looking at what do organizations actually do? All right, so what are the issues, but what sort of support is in place? What works, what doesn't work? So we talked to health and safety managers. We talked to, we did a focus group. We talked to unions and we did another big batch of interviews. So we talked to another 36 drivers um, and an additional six managers. And we did a review of the academic literature as well. So we're really just trying to get a feel for what do we know um, and what are the problems, you know, both from a manager's organisational point of view, but also from an individual's point of view as well. And what we found, and again, I'm just giving you snippets here because that's all we've got time to do really. But what we found was that organisations typically were quite reactive rather than proactive, particularly about kind of well-being initiatives. So there was a lot of focus on safety, as you'd expect in a driving profession, but there was less focus on, on kind of health initiatives. They were there quite often, they were, they were there, but they weren't necessarily being engaged with by the workforce, or not all the time, at least. Um, there seemed to be kind of a, a limited well-being and mental health strategies. So again, they were there, but perhaps there wasn't the engagement and line managers didn't necessarily have the skills or the training or the support themselves to have those kind of discussions with people. There was a, an element of just not knowing where to begin with these things, you know, so, so yes, we know. So the drivers would tell us quite openly, yes, it's a stressful job, this is stressful, that's stressful, this, you know, this is an issue or whatever. Um, and the manager similarly would probably be aware of that, but there seemed to be a bit of a disconnect between what do we do about it? How do we actually support people in this? Um, so and, and uh, to, alongside that, there was this sometimes reluctance to talk about health issues because you're scared about losing your license. Right? So that brought in a certain amount of, of reticence. And there was quite a lot of people also talked to us about things like because it's quite a male dominated industry that the culture was such that people didn't talk about these things and there was kind of trying to change that but that, that change takes time and, and changing culture in particular and um, does take a, a certain amount of time so we had all of this knowledge and insight and information um, and then we decided well what, what, what do we do with this um, and what we did was we developed and launched the Age, Health and Professional Drivers Network. And we consolidated all of that information into these kind of best practice guidelines. So these were industry led because it was all about the information that the industry had given to us. And we liaised with them in terms of how best to present it back. And we, we focused on and identified those 10 areas of health and well-being that we felt were um, important. But as well as kind of identifying them, we also highlighted um, uh, tips and advice about general um, issues in relation to these 10 areas, but also specific advice in relation to older workers. We highlighted and provided kind of links and resources that people could go to. Um, and we made these available for free to organisations. Um, you can, there is, I think I've put the website link there, but I've put a couple of examples here. So things like bereavement and working patterns both came out as things that were important. Um, and I'll just talk very briefly about these. So working patterns, we'd expect that, I think, you know, that didn't surprise me. So things like shift work or working long hours, are, 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 we, we know that they are linked to poor health and well-being. We also know that with age, we are more likely to see older individuals who want to change their working patterns. You know, so maybe they want to approach retirement in a gradual pattern or they want to move to a part time working. Um, and organisations, I, th you know, I, I think need to really consider about the type of working patterns that they offer if they want to encourage people to stay. Because we were talking to drivers who were saying to us, um, I want to go part time, but they they can't facilitate that they won't be able to do that so i'm just going to leave 
you know, and, that, and when you've got that alongside a massive driver shortage, you're like, Look, we, need, we need to think about this. So working patterns were really important. The bereavement issue wasn't something that I anticipated. And that's one of the things I love about research is you find things that you didn't expect to find. Uh, it makes a lot of sense when it's pointed out, but we had a lot of people and managers talking to us about that they'd experienced bereavement um, or a number of bereavements. Um, and particularly, we know as we get older, we're more likely to experience bereavements around us. Um, so with an ageing workforce, you are more likely to have needs from your employees that you could perhaps be able to provide support for but that wasn't really set up people were talking to us about i don't know who to talk to i didn't know where to get any support from this i didn't know what to do about it so we kind of highlighted that as one of of, of the 10 areas that we felt was important to look at and of course we built all of this and some of other stuff that, that I haven't had time to share with you into this impact case that Eleanor mentioned in the introduction. And I was really, really sort of, sort of glad and grateful that the business school supported that impact case. Um, and I've just put a summary of it there and I'm not, I'm not gonna read all of these out, but you can see that it was things like developing the network, it was working alongside kind of GM, um, and the DWP, it was working with transport organisations to be able to kind of illustrate to the within the impact case that these guidelines have made a difference. Um, and I'd just like to highlight, so I've put a number of quotes up here, but these I just want to highlight these two, which are both from different logistics firms. Um, and these quotes kind of highlighting how the guidelines have made a difference. You know, so the first one, this one saying, you know, we use key recommendations and to kind of develop new initiatives and to provide the argument for organisational investment. And the second one saying that the guidelines were able to guide kind of the provision of different training courses. So these were the kind of things that we were able to use in the impact case to say, look, like, we did this research, this research resulted in this, but actually that's then made an impact because companies have used it in this way. Um, I mean, obviously the impact case itself is, is, is much more detailed than this, but this gives you a little bit of a flavour of what we were doing. And then, so this, the guidelines were launched in 2019 um, and we were sort of working hard on disseminating them and getting them out there and starting to pull together the impact, um, the impact statements and so on through 2019 to 2020 and then of course COVID hit right? so you know one of the things that we did as a result of COVID um, was to do, bring together a age health and professional drivers network response to that so we um, sort of distributed a questionnaire to all of our members and asked them what they were doing about COVID what sort of advice they gave and we collated that and we shared it to the other members and that 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 was kind of a really useful mechanism, I think, both to give us a bit of insight into what was happening, but also just to share those examples of best practice or bad practice, depending on what we've been told. Um, and we also sort of, sort of subsequently, and we've stayed in touch with the AHPD in terms of newsletters and so on. But at the same time, I also got brought in to the PROTECT studies, um, which was national core studies on transmission and the environment. And these are Manchester, it's not just Manchester, but Manchester is pay, playing a key part in this. And these are studies that are kind of funded by the government via the HSE. Um, and looking in particular at kind of how COVID has impacted and been managed in organizations. And there's, there's a huge amount of studies that are going on. And um, if you're interested, I would encourage you to have a look at the Protect website to see. I can't talk about all of it because there's just so much. I've kept myself quite busy as a way of avoiding the pandemic. <laughs> um, but I, I'm just going to give you a, a few little flavours of the type of work that we've been doing. So the first one, and this is too word heavy, I do apologise, you're not going to be able to read any of this. So, But this was a study that we did looking at construction firms. So we did this over two phases. So the first phase we did interviews with kind of more senior health and safety people and senior representatives of an, four different large construction companies. Um, and this was timed during December 2020 to February 21. Um, and we followed that up with a phase two study, um, which completed in February this year. And um, the phase two sort of involved people who were working across all different levels in construction and also included contractors. So we're talking to employees. 
And the, the actual kind of the information that came out of that was actually quite positive. You know, that people, I mean, the first phase, it was really positive, but you'd expect that when you're talking to senior representatives. Um, and I was kind of really interested to see what other people would say. Yeah, but actually, we, yeah, we've got a very kind of generally positive picture of the way in which um, COVID rules and, and mitigations and so on have been rolled out. There were some examples um, of non-compliance with, rural, with rules, and the, this, this is quite interesting in the construction sector. There seemed to be a bit of an in, um, kind of a barrier, I suppose, to the COVID rules in terms of traditional health and safety challenges. So things like if you have to lift a very heavy thing and it takes two people to do it, you can't socially distance at the same time. And although the organisation would have kind of advice and rules about that, sometimes people said, I'm not going to ignore that because I need to help my colleagues. So they, that, that their kind of traditional safe working kind of superseded sometimes the, the, COVID, the COVID mitigations that were in place. So there was, there was some interesting stuff there about compliance and non-compliance. Um, there was also quite a lot of discussion about people who were able to work at home and those who weren't able to work at home. Um, and there was some talk about there being like an us them culture, you know, and the risks were very different and, and that, that's, that's kind of self-explanatory, isn't it? But the impact of COVID and the, and the risk mitigations that were in place did seem to vary depending um, on, on, in terms of the impact on well-being. So we did look at well-being as well. And it depended on the context of work. So whether you were working indoors or outdoors, for example, whether you were working at home or on site. Um, and also maybe the level of organisation you were working at as well, and the type of job role. So lots of stuff to get our teeth into there. Um, but generally, COVID, people were quite positive about the way in which COVID safety had been implemented, and that integrated with the existing safety culture that is already there within the construction environment. So that was quite a positive message that came out. There's two massive reports. If you're interested in construction, I can share them with you. Um, a couple of other studies, and again, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I've only got five minutes left, but I am, I am getting there. <laughs> um, it's, the top one was looking at public transport. So again, a two-phase study that looked at public transport. Um, some of the key things that came out of this was um, that the COVID mitigations that have been put in place, some of which kind of it, it consisted of, of people working in different ways or being more isolated from each other, People talked about feeling quite lonely and feeling quite isolated. And, 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 and that was kind of, I think that's an interesting thing to consider um, in terms of the kind of communication methods that organizations might have in place to try and kind of, you know, sort of work against that. There was also lots of discussion about high levels of uncertainty, um, whether or not mitigations were in place, were they carry on, what's going to happen in the future. Public transport numbers are no, they're still nowhere near back to where they were pre-pandemic. So there is a lot of concern in the sector about what might happen in the future. Um, and there was some interesting stuff that came out about in-group behaviours, how people behave differently in terms of things like social distancing and, and mask wearing, depending on whether they were interacting with a passenger who they saw as their out group or whether they were interacting with a colleague who they saw as an in-group and as less risky which is probably not the case, but that there was just some interesting dynamics there in terms of how we perceive risk. And then the bottom study was completely different to what I normally do, but this was looking at um, areas of depth. Uh, so SAGE identified a number of different regional areas in the UK that had levels of COVID that seemed to endure, they had enduring prevalence. And they asked the protect team to kind of explore that and I ended up being heavily involved in this study and, and, and led this study. And we inter so what we ended up doing, we interviewed 19 directors of public health and asked them what they thought, you know, the, 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 the cause and factors were. Um, and again, it's a massive report I can <laughs> share with you. Um, but what we found, the key findings were kind of structural factors. So things like deprivation were really important, the type of employment, that people were in. So things like having access to sick pay, working a zero hour contract, being in insecure employment, were all linked to the ability or not to self-isolate, which was also then linked 
um, you know, to, to, to the likelihood of contracting COVID. But these also converge with other demographic factors, so things like ethnicity and age and the vaccination, vaccination rates were all kind of key drivers of prevalence. This was fascinating, a really interesting study, and we're going to be um, following that up. So these are just some, <laughs> but these are the main ones that I've been involved in. Um, in terms of phase three, so this is the next steps, we've just received a third year of, of funding for the PROTECT study. This will be the final, um, <laughs> the, um, you know, that we, we do in this. And so we're going to do a follow up on the enduring prevalence work, but we're going to look at it in a greater Manchester context. So what, focusing on workplaces. So now we're all living with COVID. Um, you know, what a workplace is doing or not doing and how do people feel about that. Um, I'm hoping to get a questionnaire survey out in July um, and distribute that um, through um, an online survey system. Um, but I'm also, if I can, I want to try and follow that up in October because I do think, I mean, hopefully not, right? Hopefully everything's going to be hunky-dory in it and we'll all be fine. But if there is kind of an uptick in COVID or, or something happens as we go towards the winter, then I'd really like to try and capture that in terms of how people feel about their level of risk at work. So that's the Greater Manchester study. And then we're also kind of trying to gather all the information we've done on all the cross-sectoral stuff. So I've talked about construction and public transport, for example, but there's been other people who've led studies on things like retail um, and food manufacturers. So which are the, the cross-sectoral stuff is kind of let's bring everything together and go, what's the commonalities and what are the differences and what can we learn um, you know, from all of these sectors? And then finally, because I am nearly, nearly done, I see Ellen is looking at me, um, but this is, is, is research that I've been looking at in terms, like it's kind of COVID related, but not completely. So it's, it's evidence that violence and aggression um, seems to be on the increase. Right, so particularly um, over the last couple of years, so surveys, for example, there's an old store survey in retail indicate a sharp increase in violence and aggression. We did a workshop um, with a number of people from different sectors, and this was alongside people in the health and safety executive. Um, they also indicated that there'd been an increase in incidences of violence and aggression. There's also been a change in the type of abuse. Um, so lots more spitting at people, for example, um, as, as a way of um, being aggressive during the pandemic. Organisations report issues around things like reporting data, how to encourage people to report, how do they collate that data, what do they do with it? They need to kind of tackle this um, issue of workplace violence and aggression just being normalised and seen as part of the job. It's just something we have to put up with and trying to overcome that and get people to talk about what's happening. So given all of that background, I'm hoping to launch this violence and aggression research network. I'm just waiting to hear if we've got some additional um, funding to be able to do that, but we've certainly got a lot of interest from industry um, to follow that up. Okay, so concluding thoughts. Um, so health and wellbeing at work going forward, COVID's changed a lot of things. So what happens next, you know, both in terms of COVID itself, but also just in terms of workplaces. So there's a huge amount of uncertainty. You need to think about um, changes in working patterns. So hybrid working, for example, how is that changing our experience of work? Lots of issues about overload and job insecurity. And then you can add in things like the cost of living crisis and so on. You know, so there's so much that we need to think about health and wellbeing going forward. I'm still trying to narrow my focus there. <laughs> and I'm still not very good at it, but I will keep endeavouring to do that. And, but I think you can see, you know, I, I like to do lots of different things, but there is always that thread of, of, of people's health and, and well-being going through it. I want to say thank you to all my colleagues. So I've, I've been fortunate to work with some wonderful colleagues um, over, over a number of years. So people in the organisational psychology group, for example, um, also the institutes that I work with. So I'm deputy director in the Work and Equalities Institute. Um, I head up the theme of social change and inequalities um, in the Thomas Ashton Institute shortly to hand over to the very capable hands of CARA, um, but also colleagues within MICRA as well, which is the Institute of Collaborative Research into Aging. So just thank you to everyone for all of the opportunities. All of the research I've talked about isn't just me, it's a, it's, it is a collaboration. 
And I also want to say thank you to my family who have been a huge support over the years. And sadly, I lost my mum and dad over the last couple of years, but I just want to say thank you. And I know you'd be proud of me. Thank you very much. Gina, that was uh, that was a fascinating lecture. Thank you very much for that. I think um, one of the interesting things you bring out is this issue, obviously, of your work on the aging population and the aging workforce, and we know that that's just such an incredibly important issue for you know for society and for economies in terms of uh, how we how we essentially retain the workforce uh, uh, with a, with an aging population. How do organisations ensure that they have uh, enough people on their staff? Um, and all of the issues that go with that. And um, so clearly an incredibly important piece of work. Um, you mentioned the issue specifically of the driver's network. Um, and of course, we heard a lot of the media in the last year or so about the issue of driver shortages, and we could see the impact that, that was beginning to have uh, in society. So um, could I ask, what, what are, are there particular plans for the driver's network? Any future plans for how you might develop this? Yeah, definitely. That's a really good question. Thank you. So, I mean, we're still kind of in contact with the network members in terms of newsletters, but I've got a couple of kind of plans up my sleeve, I suppose, in terms of what we do next. So the, one of the things I want to do is update the guidelines. So because three years is a long time, <laughs> right? So there's been a lot of change. So there's some simple updating I want to do, which is just things like making sure the links to all the resources still work, you know, for example. Um, but also to add in the COVID advice, mm -hmm. you know, because I think we gathered that, we've got it, let's make it available to people. Um, but in, uh, another kind of research angle that I'm, I want to follow up and I'm working up a research bid at the moment is to kind of look in particular at fatigue mm -hmm. in the workplace, because that was something that came out as, as being really relevant within the driver population. Um, it's it's, it's that, that experience of fatigue and how it has a negative impact both on their health, but also their ability to do to do the work and to remain in work. So I think we need to consider how we monitor and measure fatigue in work. How do we support individuals? What kind of interventions might be appropriate? Um, and I don't have any answers to any of it yet, but the plan is to get some answers to it and to, and to share that information. Um, and also, if we think about COVID, then long COVID, fatigue is heavily linked, you know, to long COVID. So I think it really talks to that kind of post-COVID agenda as well. So that's quite a long answer, but yeah, update the guidelines and think about fatigue. It's interesting how, um, you know, you look back at the body of work that you've done as an academic and you talk about the health and well-being strand that runs through it all, but it's also interesting how even some of the things that on the face that look quite disparate actually will come together, you know, the ageing workforce, but then the, the, the link to obviously the, the COVID work you've been doing more recently. So there is this, this uh, really nice connection and, and links between all of these apparently disparate things. That you're doing. I'm really glad you said that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was hoping to pull up. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, it is true. So I, I, I feel like I do do a lot of different things, but actually when you break it down, I'm interested in whether or not people are damaged or not by work. And what and, and and if they are, then what can we do to try and minimise that? And and there's a, 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 that's the basic kind of thing that I'm I'm looking at. So. Fascinating. Thank you. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. So um, I'm mindful. So we have quite a few people in the room, which is great to see, and uh, we also have quite a few people uh, online as well. So I'm sure we've got some questions coming through there, Jim. I want to ensure that we sort of uh, spread our questions around, uh, both with. Those who are here with us today and actually those who are joining us online. If I could begin maybe with just uh, one or two questions from the floor, and we'll go to the online group and then we'll come back. So, uh, Jared, you're straight in there. So, <laughs> so um, congratulations. I think your star model from the role I'm doing at the moment is mostly. It's great to see how you're connecting um, several institutes simultaneously with work that does hang together pretty well actually i don't think you should apologize for too much <laughs> diversity in your talk ago but i just think about how you've got an opportunity with that to to actually narrow without um, without narrowing and the way to do that might be to think theoretically about some of the mechanisms that that connect the 
the rich tapestry of projects that you've worked on. Um, and I just wondered what thoughts you might have along those lines. I'm yeah. intrigued why, you know, work doesn't damage as old as we get older. Some people thrive on it and other people clearly don't. So what do you think really at the root differentiates? Oh, I mean, that's a really tricky question. <laughs> I, said, I did say it's it was a great right place to work. <laughs> no, I mean, it is a really good point. I mean, I think there's, there's going to be, there's clearly going to be a number of reasons why some people are damaged and some aren't. And the, and the stress literature, is, as you will know, has kind of, kind of explored that a little bit. And we still don't have a full answer for it. And um, there will be individual differences will be important, but so will the type of workplace and the type of support that's in place. So, I, I mean, I can see my colleagues interested in individual differences nodding. <laughs> but my interest kind of comes in more in, in terms of the support, the type of support that can be put in place. So understanding the, the stresses, because that's the context. And we can use theoretical frameworks to kind of build around that. But also then what do we do about it you know and how do we how do we kind of tackle that and i think that's where we don't have the knowledge and i think you're right that's where we can maybe consolidate it a little bit more across those themes thank you Sheen. any other questions before we have lena hi Sheena. congratulations thank you um my question was kind of related to a point that um elena made about you know how it's all quite different but i think it reflects something quite well that at least i've noticed where you know health and well-being has kind of moved a little bit away from just the certain working conditions and stress to a more holistic view around culture and personal experiences people have in their life and how that influences their behavior and health at work and i think especially those things around bereavement and how that impacts the drivers has been really interesting and I wonder whether there's been anything done about that, you know, in, in regards to how people talk about the personal issues at work, especially some of those male dominated kind of industries. Anything come from that in regards to extra support or interventions? There's, or... there's been additional training put in place in terms of kind of empowering managers to have those conversations. So that's that's been, been helpful. But I do think that COVID is probably going to have a positive impact in that regard in that we've all started talking a little bit more um, about mental health and about the need for support and about what's happening in our home life having an impact so but so in some organizations and some industries because that's always the caveat isn't it because we not all jobs are the same you know then i think that support has got better um, and those conversations have increased and, and that's a positive thing um, but I do think there's still a lot of different types of work where there is that support just does not exist. And that really ties in when I talked about the Enduring Prevalence Project, for example, that idea of, of, of the nature of work and, and deprivation actually having a big impact on that was looking particularly at the COVID risk. But it will also have an impact on our support networks and our ability to and draw on people, whether that be from our family or, or whether it be from, from a workplace, you know, so there's a big disparity still. I think it's going in the right direction. Um, my concern, I suppose, would be that it gets lost, you know, that we had this sudden, we did have a big uptick in terms of talking about these things and, and companies on the whole, and I've spoken to a lot of companies over the last couple of years, they have recognise the need to provide additional support. The universities, though, you know, we've, we've, we've been offered additional support, which is a great thing. And a lot of other companies have done the same, but will it continue? You know, particularly as we as we face a potential recession and all of the other um, crazy stuff that's going on in the world, you know, that it may, it may just get lost a little bit, which would be a shame. Thanks for the question, an interesting answer, Shana. I'm going to turn to you, Jim, just to see if we could perhaps have a couple of questions yeah. from our, our online audience. Sure, and actually they follow up very, very nicely from the comments just made, Gina. One was, um, do you think more health stroke wellbeing initiatives have actually been put in place or prioritised uh, in organisations since COVID? So that almost, you almost answered half the question there. Uh, and if so, would it continue longer term to kind of deal with that question with that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it is very similar to what I've just said. I mean, I think I think there has been more provision, definitely. There's definitely been more provision in some places. I mean, I'm going to put that caveat in there again. Um, what I'm less certain of is the degree to which people are engaging with those 
you know, so far, again, I'll use the university as an example, so I know the university have put in place additional support for employees and for students, but what I personally don't have insight into is the degree to which that's being taken up. And I think that's going to be something to monitor, you know, go, go, going forward. Um, longer term, I think it'll vary. It'll just vary between the good and the less good employers and the employers who need to retain people and those who can afford to um, have see people as more dispensable. And there will unfortunately be financial decisions, you know, financial drivers that will impact on whether or not things like wellbeing initiatives are um, supported. I mean, I can argue, and I can argue with a strong evidence base that there's a lot of reason to invest in such support. So for example, um, counselling or employee assistance programmes are shown to repay the investment that you put into them. And the evidence for that is really quite clear. Um, you know, however, if you want to make a short-term cost cut, then cutting things like that can be a way to save money in the short term. Longer term, I think it's more detrimental. So I don't know. Is the answer? It'll do. It'll depend. It's an academic answer, isn't it? <laughs> 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 really yeah, it's a psychology <laughs> answer as well. Um, but it, it will definitely differ by workplace and industry and the degree to which people are supported and are damaged in some way by work will depend on, on a number of things. And I include in type of employment, job role, deprivation status, um, age, and, and a number of other things in, in that. So another question. Just yeah, 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 we'll come back to the floor sure, here. Yeah. Um, uh, someone's asked, how can companies ensure their training methods are engaging enough to tackle modern workplace challenges, especially in the light of COVID? Was that training methods? Yeah, training methods. Um, I mean, I think with training in particular, you want to get, but you need to evaluate it. I mean, that's the bottom line. You need to know whether the training is appropriate, whether people are engaging with it, um, and whether 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 it's working. Right. So, and I don't mean just like, do people enjoy it? You know, so did you have fun on your training day? I mean, that's <laughs> interesting to know, but it doesn't actually tell us anything um, longer term. Um, so if you want to really know if it's working, you need to, before you design and deliver the training, you need to think about how am I going to determine if this is successful. And that might be that we have um, decreased, uh, increased productivity or increased performance or decreased sickness and decreased um, stress reports. And so depending on what the training is for. Um, but if you don't evaluate it, you're never going to know if it's working. So that that but it is that's the step that quite often isn't done, and the training literature shows us quite clearly that the most training isn't evaluated or not evaluated very well. You know, so that's that's what I would be advising organisations to do is think about what you what the need is, identify how you're going to try and tackle that need. So if it is, for example, offering additional support or additional um, well-being services then think about how you're going to evaluate whether that's worked and build that into the delivery of the training programme. Um, and then ultimately, you'll be able to show whether it's effective or not. And if it isn't, then you need to think about changing it. And if it is, then you've got your argument for why it should continue. Okay, so let's come back to the floor. Yes, your question here? Yeah? yeah, I come from the employee benefits and more in space. So in answer to the question, our companies investing, they are. Um, massively so in switching from benefits to well-being. Yeah. Um, but to your point on measurement, my question was um, for you when you report well-being, the, the challenge is people spend the money but they don't necessarily know whether there's an effect. In the research that you've done, I just wondered how you were measuring well-being. I mean there's a number of different ways in which you can measure it. So you can measure it in a traditional kind of stress sense so you measure things like um, psychological well-being um, but people also kind of look just at physical health as well but you, you can look at the number of referrals to support services you can look at performance you know and so so there are a number of different ways me personally if I was going to do it I'd probably want to do kind of almost like an old-fashioned stress audit and, and really try and get a feel for what what people think is um, a, a problem for them and whether that changes over time and, and then whether that change has a positive or negative impact on their health. And I think that's really valuable. And, so, and some companies still do this, clearly, you know, they, 
there's a lot of companies that, that deliver that kind of um you know sort of methodology you know but i think relatively few organizations de design it in and you probably know more than i do about this in, in that way but i think that's that's the missing gap i think is in terms of thinking about what we do before we put an intervention in place Mario, I think you've had a question. Uh, I do, yes. Uh, but before asking my question, uh, let me just say that uh, as I was listening to your presentation, my thoughts were very similar to those of Gerard. Uh, I, I, I found your presentation, your work, uh, especially the breadth of that work, very, very, very impressive. It, it, and it was basically <coughs> reminding me a little bit of uh, Albert Einstein's advice that, you know, to to really enhance science and our understanding, we need to avoid making lots of holes in the same piece of wood. So mm -hmm. I think that's exactly uh, what you are doing. Uh, coming back to, to my question, uh, as a society, we're gradually trying to get out of the impact of COVID. But now we've got a number of other things hitting us. So we've got very high inflation, which is very, very persistent and it very likely we will experience that year after year. We've got, of course, higher interest rates that will further increase costs for us as a society. We've got on top of that a war that has no, con no consequences for food and prices of food. So, you know, as we're getting out of COVID, there are lots of other things hitting us as a society. I was wondering, how do you think, in terms of future research, how will that influence things because you were mentioning things like support and of course mm -hmm. this kind of support costs uh, uh, risk, uh, and cut with the resources inflation the higher interest rate might affect our ability to put in place this kind of support so do you have any thoughts on that I was wondering. yeah no i mean i think that's a really valid point so i mean there is a, a huge number of things that are, are not great at the moment and that's going to have a, a, a real impact <laughs> on all of us now whether or not the workplace is the appropriate place to provide that support i think is is, is, is one of the questions and and I think the answer to that is, you know, if, if not the workplace, then who else? You know, where else are people going to access it? And also the impact on the workplace is significant. So if I am um, not coping with work, whether it be because of work stress or external stress, you know, including all of the things that you've just listed, then that's going to have a negative impact on my ability to do a good job you know which will have a knock-on impact on other on other people um, and, and and again the evidence would show that actually investing in that support will long term be it'll, it'll get your money back on that investment but that's that's an easy answer right so but that's not going to be the same for every individual in, it, in, it, in every job and, that, and the ability to provide the support will differ between different jobs so i Part of me wants to argue really strongly that work should be at least trying to offer, you know, that kind of um, support initiatives. Um, and I think employers like the university or construction firms, for example, can do that. But then if you start to think about people who are working on industry or contracts and people who are doing work in gig work, for example, and the fact that there isn't going to be the money available, you know, from, from organisations who are struggling to keep afloat, and all the small companies or the people you know running their own businesses, then it's a whole different kind of ball game. There was talk a number of years ago of, of, of kind of there being more support from government level in terms of these kind of initiatives. Um, maybe you know that would be one solution, but it would be foolish of me to assume you know that the money would be available to, to do that as well. No, that's very, very interesting. I was also thinking about for complementarities because you know you're looking at it from the point of view of COVID and health, and then we've got all these other issues that are, you know, not, not health related, but you know, more economic and can affect. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just mindful of time. I wondered whether Jim, we might have one, maybe uh, one time for one. I was just going to commit on, on, on the discussion. I, I wonder if. Part of the solution is, is what you were saying earlier. We know that organisations spend a lot of training, resources, additional programmes, and a lot of them 
of rubbish because organizations don't systematically evaluate. We don't often know, and organizations themselves don't know which are the good and the bad ones. They say, we're spending all this money on additional stuff, and you know, all these fancy, flashy things. And actually, there are simpler interventions they can put into place. So I wonder if maybe now is a good time to extra double down on that point we're making that we really need evaluation programs rather than just apply it over a few months and then the winds change and we shift it. And I think maybe that is the answer. If economic resources are less, we have to be more frugal and fiscal in how we spend them. Mm -hmm. So it's that balance of don't take don't take it away holistically, take away the stuff that to be honest is a bit fluffy anyway, and stick with the stuff that actually works. Yeah. I don't know. Like tells us a whole bunch of stuff that works. Yeah. I completely course. agree with that. I mean I think getting that message across to organizations is, 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 is a different issue. You know, but, I mean, that would completely make sense, you know, so put your money in things that you know are going to be cost effective and useful and helpful and don't throw your money away on stuff that isn't, isn't proven to, to work in any, in any way. But unfortunately, what we are more likely to see is that companies just cut the training budgets because they need to make short term gains. Okay, I'm I'm mindful of time because I think um, sadly we are um, uh, running out of time and uh, we, we need to think about drawing to a close. So uh, first of all, Sheena, just to thank you for a, a very insightful and thought provoking lecture. It's really really fascinating. I can see you can see from the amount of discussion that's been generated uh, just how engaging uh, an important a, a topic is. Uh, by extension too, I'd like very much to thank the audience, obviously the audience are here in Manchester and indeed uh, the many people who joined us online for your contribution in terms of questions and contributing to the discussion. And a reminder of course that for those who are here joining us today in Manchester that there um, will be drinks uh, after the event um, and obviously an opportunity for you to put your uh, any further questions you have to Sheena uh, and to continue the discussion. Before we finish, I just want to um, remind everybody that, of course, AMBS has a, a series of, of very interesting events and presentations planned. Our next event is the Vital Topics event, uh, which is, uh, will be hosted by Andy um, uh, Haldane, titled Leveling Up, What, Why and How, and that's scheduled for Thursday, the 9th of June. So I hope to see many of you again uh, at that event, but for now, thank you very much to everybody for joining us, uh, and of course, Again, many thanks and congratulations to Professor Sheila Johnson. Jim.